Well, <laughs> it's, it's one thing for kings to promise when they're crowned to follow the law, and it's quite another thing for them to do it throughout their reign. And that's where effectively the rubber met the road with Magna Carta, because we come to a particular king, King John, uh, and John is one of only two kings in English history never to have a successor named after him. So there's never been a John II, and I can confidently predict there never will be uh, a John II. That name uh, is definitely off the list. You know, think about when they name a new prince, you know, what are the names in contention? Not John. Uh, now, there really are two proximate causes for Magna Carta. Uh, one is a foreign policy disaster, and the other is the character of the king. And I would argue that without those two factors, we would not have had Magna Carta. So the foreign policy disaster. Uh, uh, Bruce mentioned the Norman Conquest. What the Norman Conquest did was to make England a cross-channel empire. So they've got England, and then they've got lands on the continent that they still control. And that's Normandy, where William the Conqueror came from. But over the course of the 12th century, they acquired basically the whole western seaboard of France. So they own basically half of France, which is great for the English, not so good for the French. Uh, so there is a, a standing conflict uh, between the French kingdom and the kings uh, of England. And it is exacerbated by the weird sort of feudal situation that obtains uh, between them because those lands in France that the English control, they are uh, held of the French king as fiefs. So the French king is actually the overlord of the English king in his capacity as Duke of Normandy, Count of Anjou, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is really a false position for two kings to be in in regard to each other uh, because the sovereignties conflict. Uh, but they haven't sorted that out uh, in the 12th and 13th centuries. Uh, and so it leads to uh, a standing conflict of interest between them. There is fairly constant war uh, between France and England in the French territories that the English control. They're always going back and forth across the border. Uh, and so now we come to the reign of John. John takes the throne in 1199 when Richard the Lionheart is killed uh, in really a rather unimportant uh, skirmish in the south uh, of France in a, a territory that he controlled. Uh, you have John on the throne, uh, and uh, the king of France is immediately going to try to take advantage of the relative instability of the succession uh, to uh, seize some land. But uh, they come to an agreement. Everything is going to be fine. And then John gets married. And that screws everything up. Uh, it, it's one of the most disastrous marriages in English history uh, for a, a number of reasons. Uh, but one reason is because of who the bride is, and particularly because of where she comes from. This is Isabel of Angoulême. Angoulême is a, a small territory in southwestern France. Uh, the problem with Angoulême is that it adjoins the county of La Marche. And La Marche was ruled by a family that were constantly rebelling against King John. Now, John did not want the Count of La Marche to marry Isabel of Angoulême. They were engaged. So he wanted to block that marriage because he feared that if these two territories were united, then there would be this big indigestible block of rebel territory in the heart of his French dominions. So he doesn't want this marriage to go forward. So what is his solution? He marries the bride himself. He scoops in, takes the bride, marries her himself. And oh, by the way, they had been postponing this relationship, you know, the, 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 the Count of La Marche and Isabel, because the bride was 12 years old. <laughs> but the king marries her anyway. Uh, now, this might have been okay if the king had compensated the Count of La Marche for stealing his fiance. But John was just the sort of guy not to do that. It would have been much better if he'd say, well, you know, I'm sorry, I took your fiance, but 
here is some extra land, here is a payment, you know, it's all good. He didn't do that. He basically thumbed his nose at his own vassal, uh, and uh, that caused the Count of La Marche to appeal to the King of France. Because, of course, the King of France is the overlord of both the Count of La Marche and the King of England. So he appeals to the King of France, and the King of France has just been waiting for an opportunity to do something against King John. And here, this is delivered to him on a silver platter. Because, of course, John has violated the rights of his vassal in taking the fiance without compensation. Uh, and so the King of France uh, or confiscates the lands that the King of England owns in France. And then he actually makes good on the confiscation by force of arms. And he invades Normandy and he conquers it. Now, the King of England has lost all the land in France, or lots of it, okay? and particularly the land that people actually care about, Normandy. Uh, and this is a complete disaster. Kings of France, or kings of any, uh, any kingdom, are not supposed to lose land. If anything, you're supposed to increase it, not lose land. Uh, and now John is in a bind because he has to try to get the land back. Okay? He needs to pay for the reconquest. He can't pay for it because now all of a sudden he's not getting any revenue from that land anymore. So he has to tax England unmercifully in order to pay for the effort to get the land in France back. So he is now in a vicious circle because the more he taxes England, uh, the more they, they hate him. Okay? But he has to get the land back or he will lose face as king. And it goes on like this for about 10 years. In 1214, he basically makes one last effort to recover the land in France. He gathers together a coalition of continental allies, in particular his nephew who is uh, a, a German nobleman. Uh, and he's going to do a pincer movement. So his allies are going to come into France from the northeast. And John is going to land in uh, Poitou in the south on the coast. Uh, and then they're going to meet up, head towards Paris, and get the king of France sort of in a vice. But it doesn't work okay, because John is bottled up on the coast. He can never meet his ally. So his ally has to go up against the King of France alone. Uh, and there is a battle between the King of France and this German ally. And the French win the battle. And the battle is called the Battle of Bouvines. Uh, and all commentators on Magna Carta will agree that there is pretty much a straight line from Bouvines to Runnymede because the barons in England are basically waiting on the sidelines to see if John is successful. If he is, maybe they'll forgive him all the other stuff he's done. But if he's not, they're done with him. And this battle takes place in July of 1214. In the fall of 1214, the barons are already gathering together uh, to talk about what to do about King John. Uh, and by the spring of that year, uh, they are actively discussing some of the issues that end up in the draft of Magna Carta. So that's the foreign policy cause for Magna Carta. But there is also a character cause for Magna Carta, which is the fact that John was detested uh, widely uh, by his barons. He was regarded as untrustworthy, vicious, cruel, uh, he was just the sort of person who you would have to extract promises from because he didn't keep his word. He was uh, basically well known uh, for that. Uh, he was somebody who acted arbitrarily. One of the things that he did to raise money uh, for this continual effort to recover land in France was to find people arbitrarily for uh, offenses that sometimes were real and sometimes invented. Uh, he would. Uh, lend uh, money to people in unrealistic amounts and then have the debt hover over them. And so people were always scared uh, of what John would do. He was very unpredictable. Uh, and really just the, the best example, I think, of the kind of cruelty that John engaged in. He got into a dispute with one of his, uh, his vassals named William de Briuse. Uh, and uh, he actually had the wife and son of this vassal starved to death. And this was widely known. All the chroniclers of the time report it. It was widely known. 
So that was the kind of thing he did. And he also would go around to the castles of his barons and demand to sleep with their wives and daughters. This is the kind of man he was. So this is the kind of person who you would definitely want to promise on parchment that he was going to be a good boy. Appreciate that. Uh, Jenny, talk about jury trial and how Magna Carta is in, obviously from, from my opening comments. Well, I think it's had a great influence in this country. But. It, it actually belongs yeah. sort of in the category of the myths of Magna Carta <laughs> uh, because uh, the word jury does not appear anywhere uh, in Magna Carta. So the idea that uh, Clause 39 of Magna Carta guarantees the right to a trial by jury is actually a much later uh, interpretation of Magna Carta. That's not what anybody thought uh, in 1215. It's a really interesting example of how uh, two phenomena can coincide in time and then over, uh, over a period of time actually uh, coalesce. So what you have is Magna Carta being uh, agreed to in 1215 and that very year uh, you have a huge event in uh, the Catholic Church called the Fourth Lateran Council where Pope Innocent III, uh, who annulled Magna Carta, okay, gathered together a huge uh, assembly of bishops and other church leaders uh, and hashed out a number of very important issues before the church at the time. And one of the things that they did was to ban clerical participation in the judicial ordeal. Now, probably a lot of you have heard of the ordeal. This is where people are forced to walk across hot coals or hold hot irons or uh, be thrown in the water. And if they, the water accepts them, if they sink, then they're innocent. If the water rejects them and they float, uh, then they're guilty. You know, of course, you have to fish them out in time if they're innocent uh, before they drown. Uh, this is something that people make fun of now. I mean, there's a wonderful scene in Monty Python and the Holy Grail about the <laughs> judicial ordeal. But this was very serious business in 1215. A lot of decisions about guilt or innocence across Europe were made on this basis. Uh, and the church had grown uncomfortable with it and withdrew its approval. Uh, and this Im almost immediately caused the ordeal to wither on the vine. And they needed something else to put in place in order to decide guilt or innocence in uh, criminal cases. Now, interestingly, on the continent, what they came up with was the inquisitorial process. Okay. In England, they went in a different direction. And by the way, that, that involves torture. Right? In England, they never embraced uh, torture. Instead, what they came up with as a fix was the jury trial. So juries had been around for other purposes for many years. They had been fat, they were fact-finding bodies. Uh, they had been used by William the Conqueror, for example, after the conquest to try to figure out what did he have in the doomsday inquest where he went around and, and, and found out what all the land was and how much it was worth. That was uh, run on the system of local juries. Uh, so juries get co-opted to take the place of the judicial ordeal. Uh, and over time, people start to assume that the clause about judgment by your peers refers to trial by jury. Okay. But that's not, in fact, how it was interpreted in 1215, because there was no right to a jury trial. There were no jury trials in 1215. So that's one of the signal myths of Magna Carta. By the 14th century, people are making that connection, and by the 17th century, uh, with Cook and other commentators, people are flat out saying that Magna Carta guarantees the right to a trial by jury. And from the beginning of our country then, we really did believe Absolutely. in a trial by jury. Absolutely, believed that that was a guaranteed right as of Magna Carta. It's not in there. Well, what about speedy trial? Well, Clause 40 uh, of Magna Carta says that uh, to no one will we deny or delay uh, justice. So this is the idea that you have to get your judgment in a reasonably uh, 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 speedy fashion. And it is an outgrowth of the sort of things that John would do, which is to imprison people sometimes for years uh, without uh, judgment. Uh, and he would do this basically to extort more and more money uh, out of the person concerned and out of their uh, family. Uh, so one of the really interesting things that you can do 
uh, in uh, reading Magna Carta is to see what King John was actually doing by what he was being uh, told not to do. Okay. Uh, and this, uh, the speedy trial is definitely that was certainly one, one of, of those. Right. 